Okay, thank you, Voice from the Data Center. Uh, so good morning, um, happy Wednesday. Half the week is over, as I said before. Um, we are completing one uh, week out of the semester. Uh, today, I planned uh, to be more practical, but I really wanted to uh, finish the balance of where uh, we left off last time. Uh, so why don't we uh, hop right in, but before we begin, uh, the administrative bits, the reading by today uh, is there. I also like to capture the reading uh, as well on the reading section in the course Canvas site. Again, I won't test you on the reading. I'll treat you like the adults that you are. And these due dates are really just for pacing for the material. I plan everything uh, to build upon other things. And pacing the reading also helps me to help you uh, to uh, review or at least uh, engage that modality, namely uh, reading through the textbook. And so please make sure you are keeping up uh, with the work. We will make use directly of several topics. Uh, we'll build upon them uh, when we go into other topics. And so if you're keeping pace and doing a little bit every day, you don't have to be a superhero, just be boring, do a little bit every day. You will be ready and carefree, skipping around. Or, but if you try to be a hero, I've found, meaning you wait until the last minute and then you find yourself in the position of, you know, staying up all night, which is not good for you, or, you know, large uh, sprints of 20 hours contiguously to try to get things done, you might be anticipating impending doom, right? Darth Vader will literally come to your dorm room and say, oh, geez, right? Um, and I'm not Darth Vader. Um, any questions about project number one? I know there are some questions. Um, please make sure you're reading the task list. Um, for this project, you are not doing any visualization, right? Uh, you're welcome to if you have a burning desire, but that's not the goal of this particular module. We will certainly have modules on different visualization types, as well as reinforce it with the Python APIs, namely matplotlib and potentially Seaborn, depending on uh, where our journey takes us. Okay, so any questions? Are the Python materials that, um, I think it's Mosh who, who does that for six hours of Python. Is that helpful? Anyone who needs to kind of refresh your memory on some Pythonisms? No? Yes? Still awake? Still sleepy? Yeah? Okay, I hear you. All right, so project number one is due tomorrow, uh, one second before midnight. It's really hard to set seconds on the due date on Canvas. It doesn't allow you to, so it's really 12.01 uh, the next morning. All right. Any questions? No questions? So I misspoke last time when I described um, what is a giga uh, versus tera. Um, I said before that terabyte was 2 to the 30, and then I also said before that gigabyte was 2 to the 30, which is not correct. So I want to take a moment or two uh, to correct the record because it's really, really important uh, to get these right. And so when you measure uh, the quantity of blocks of storage or memory addresses or um, size of the disk, the number of bytes collectively that a disk device can store, you measure in terms of power of two. Now, certainly in some retailers, they're gonna say something like a megabyte is a million. It's not really a million. It's a power of two, which is a little bit more than a million, but they just say, eh, it's close enough, it's a million, because it's easier to understand a million uh, versus two to the 20 power for the average user. And so two to the 30 is 1024 or one kilo megabytes, uh, which is a gigabyte, a giga, um, and tera is 1024 gigas. Now in the nomenclature, when you see a capital B, that refers to uh, bytes, right? Eight bits is a byte. When you see a lowercase b, that refers to bits. In computer networking, when you look at the bandwidth or the rate at which um, bits are sent across the wire, they often measure it in terms of bits, like one gigabit, right? Um, but in disks, they often measure that in bytes, like maybe um, four terabytes. And so this is just to say capital B versus lowercase b matters when you're describing the size of a storage mechanism. Okay. Any questions? 
So to correct that, tera is two to the 40 power, giga is two to the 30 power. And then of course, four bits is a nibble. Um, for the okay. Any questions? No? All right. And so where we last left off, we talked about a magnetic disk device and this idea of dividing up this device into units um, is how you describe any sort of file system object that you might store on it. Now I say file system object specifically instead of file because it's not just a file you can store on your disk. And so where we left off, we talked about our disk device, the jar of your memory. And this thing is almost like a record player. You have a set of platters, and these are some either polymer or metallic uh, surface disk that has been treated with this ferromagnetic material. And it's arranged. I mean, There are concentric uh, circles of what looks like the magnetic tape that we talked about. And along those concentric circles, we have those north and south pole oriented magnets that you can change with the right head on the read right head, or you can read as a zero bit or a one bit with the read part of the read right head. And so this arm assembly to it is attached to some lever arm. And these lever arms kind of at the end of them, the read right head, that same read right head that we talked about. And that lever arm can move positioning the read right head over a particular concentric circle or cylinder on our disk device. And so that positioning is called the seek time. And it takes some time, usually a few milliseconds. And the platters rotate like a record player. And so whenever you want to read, information, our sequence or string of zeros and ones stored in magnetic polarity along a ferromagnetic, a ferromagnetic material, these surfaces, um, it takes time in order to position the read right head to the correct um, cylinder and the correct track. Uh, and that impacts the performance of your disk. And so if you go on something like Amazon or wherever, and you look up the specifications for a disk, when you pay for a quote unquote high performance disc, you're paying for that engineering involved with making these things faster, more high performance. You have to pay for that engineering. The good news is that it's coming down in price. And when we look at these devices, we have a physical construct, namely uh, the sector on the disc. And then we have a corresponding logical construct, a block, which is a unit of data, ones and zeros, that we traffic in. And so these blocks, a collection of blocks is what a file is. And these blocks are associated or written to occupy sectors. Now it's more efficient to transfer blocks than to transfer individual bits. And the reason for that has to do with our Fondoian architecture, our Princeton architecture, if you will, um, because this bus, this um, almost like a spinal cord, over which you transfer data between our disk device and our memory, that is 10 times an order of magnitude slower than memory. And so if you were to fetch individual bits from your disk, you would pay the cost of transferring that bit at a time over the bus, which would result in very, very decreased flow performance. And so to pay for that cost in the slowdown, of transferring things across the bus, you aggregate sets of bits, specifically one sector at a time, and do what's called a bulk data transfer. Okay. All right. Now, when we talk about a file, first, any questions? Any questions? No? All right. So when we talk about a file, a file is a logical construct. And a file you can think of as an array of these standard units, these blocks. And a block can be different sizes depending on your file system. It could be 512 bits, 1024, 4096, all sorts of block sizes. Now, when you create a file system on your computer, the choice you make about the block size 
has to do with your application. And there are all sorts of considerations, that right? You could take a semester of uh, computer performance tuning, right? But nonetheless, we have these files. And a file is nothing more than an array of blocks. And a file has a name, but that text name is only meaningful to us. The underlying system, the operating system, doesn't care about the file name. That's so that we can remember what it is and where it is. Underneath the covers, our file is an array of blocks. And so we can think of this array of blocks in the following way. It's represented as what's called a linked list to something in data structures. And whenever you try to locate the so-called address of whenever you try to locate a block, its location on disk is comprised of a number of pieces of information. You have the track, which is the cylinder, which concentric circle. You have the sector, what region along that concentric set of circles. And then you have the platter, which particular disk um, is being referenced. Those three pieces of information are the so-called disk address for that particular block. And so whenever you have a file, in addition to the name, you have the address associated with where that first block is for that file. And so your directory is nothing more than a special data structure. It's literally a table, and that table has four entries, and some file systems have some other nuanced pieces of information. But in general, you have four entries, the name, which is for our consumption, the track, sector, and platter, which comprise, comprises rather uh, the disk address. And so here, if you had, for example, file A, and that was comprised of four blocks worth of data, you'd have an entry in the table called file A, and then you'd have the disk address, the track, the sector, and the platter associated with where that first block in file A was located on disk. And these blocks don't necessarily occupy contiguous sectors on the disk. They can be scattered all around uh, the disk device. And for that reason, most modern, not even modern, they've been doing this from the late 80s, early 90s, most block structures underneath the covers at the end of the data containing portion is a region that contains an address, a track, a sector, and a platter, which is the address of the next block's worth of data. And so with this, you would have, in the case of file A, you'd have a list of four blocks, and they can be scattered arbitrarily around the disk. Now, as you can imagine, if you wanted to read file A quickly, and each one of its four many blocks was scattered on a different location, different address on the disk device, you're going to have four different seats to position uh, this lever arm to position the read write head over the correct cylinder. And then you're going to have a rotational latency, time to spin up the disk to move it so that the correct sector is underneath the read part of the read write head. And then you're going to read out that data payload containing portion. And so when you deal with operating system, file system, they try as much as possible to organize your file storage, your blocks, so that they're as contiguous as possible. But that's not always a hard and fast rule, because when it's contiguous, you can do a bulk data transfer just by one rotation on your read head without having to see and spin up and spin down the disk. Okay. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? And so, yes. Um, can we think about the um, associative table kind of similar to a linked list, maybe an SQL or something like that. It's a little bit different. I'm not an SQL person, um, but this table is a map, and there are all sorts of optimizations that they make to it. They're trying to make it fast. Um, in modern uh, hardware, there's specialized hardware that almost looks like a OPM system that you can use to make this really, really fast. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't introduce caching in the discussion for this class, since that's more of an operating system's 200 level ish topic. Um, but you also um, pull this data beyond the size of a block that you have this, and then you don't even pay the cost for the transaction uh, to go across the bus. You just do it locally uh, from cash. Um, any other questions? Did that answer your question? Um, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Um, so, let's see. Um, 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 blocks. 
list. Ah, yes, yes. So this idea of a directory is nothing more than a table. And this particular table is stored on disk alongside the other files on disk. And so a directory is nothing special. It's a file system object, but this file system object has names and disk addresses associated with files or arrays of blocks on disk. Okay, any questions that make sense? Okay. And so let's continue on with a file system. And in the earliest days in the history in computing, you had a disk and they were relatively small based on today's standards. And you collected all of your files in one place in this construct, your storage pool. Now, of course, as computing grew more successful, more people found usages uh, for digital um, computing. And the files, therefore, the things you stored, it grew in number. And so this proliferation of files made it unwieldy if you have all of your files in one place. And so the directory was created specifically to give you some abstraction, uh, to be able to group together sets of files under a name quantity. And that name quantity is the directory that you know today. Now, of course, in the earlier days, they said, okay, well, this directory is gonna have a fixed set of names associated with it. And in this schematic, each one of these squares is a directory and it has a name associated with it. Now, as a user of a computer back then, you typically logged in and shared uh, a central computer and this directory structure was defined for you. You couldn't create them yourself. Um, on graphical systems, a folder is nothing more than a graphical representation of a directory. It's the same thing. And so what this directory did, it allowed you to solve the grouping problem and also the naming problem. You might have a file called examples.txt and you might need that for different purposes. So you can have multiple files on your file system named examples.txt, but you have one purpose with mail, one purpose with testing, et cetera. And so it allowed you to expand upon the use of names that were perhaps common names because you can associate these names with particular purposes by designating them within a particular directory. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? All right. And so as the use further grew, um, we kind of overgrew this idea of directories and grouping. And they decided, okay, more people find this digital computer useful. So we're going to have each user of the computer have his or her own directory. And so what ended up, what it ended up being called was a so-called home directory. And because these computers were centralized and shared among a population of users, each user then had a directory. And when you log in, you are taken to your quote unquote home directory. And then within your home directory, your user directory, you had the standard set of directories associated with it. And so this made it very more efficient in order to search for files. As the usage grew, more and more people had purposes for this wonderful tool. And it allows you to search things, a better grouping uh, type of capability, but it introduced this idea of a user directory or home directory. Now, within this user directory, you have your standard set of directories that was predetermined for you. And this introduced this idea of a path name. A path name is a hierarchical construct, and it represents the series of directories, these specialized file system objects that contain lists and addresses of files on disk. And in this hierarchy on different operating systems, you specify these folders or these directories in different ways. And so on Unix operating systems and Mac OS underneath the covers is a variant of Berkeley Systems Division or BSD uh, Unix, you use forward slash to connote um, a, a path or a directory along a sequence of directories. And in this hierarchy, you start out with your user directory. And then within your user directory, there's another entry, which is another directory for these standard directories um, at this particular point in the history. 
And so here, if you want to go to user one's name, you give user one as a directory, and you separate the individual directories along your so-called path with these forward slashes on the Unix platform. On Windows, Microsoft Windows um, ecosystem, it's a little bit different. Uh, they use backslash as your so-called path separator. And so this backslash is preceded in the beginning uh, by the disk drive uh, identifier. And on the Windows products, they identify drives using alphabetic characters where the default is C. And so here, when we say C colon, we refer to the disk device, the logical disk device. And then here, backslash user says, okay, the user directory. And then within that user directory, we have my name directory. Now, of course, in Unix, we don't identify the drive explicitly. We do it implicitly. And in Unix, and it's quite elegant, every device on your system, whether it's a disk or your network card or what have you, every device on your system is identified as a directory. And so when you read or create a drive and you have a storage drive, logical drive attached to your system, that logical drive is mapped to a directory name. And so everything is consistent. Okay, any questions about this? Does that make sense? Yeah, all right. And so this gives rise to a tree-based structure. And a tree is a really important data structure in computer science. And it draws its name, of course, from the tree that you see outside. But trees in computer science are drawn upside down, right? If you were to imagine a tree, and this is where my artwork fails me, right? There we go, that's a tree. Um, in this case, the so-called root of the tree is on top, and we have what are called nodes, and these nodes represent some construct in your system, and we have edges coming from that root. Uh, and each node, as it's called, these circles in this depiction, has so-called children, right? And between nodes, we have siblings at, that are at the same level of the tree. Now, this idea of creating directories and creating directories within directories gives rise to a tree structure, your so-called directory tree. And that directory tree, you can depict just like this tree over here, uh, computer science data structure. You can represent the entire directory structure or series of path names uh, using a tree. And so the idea of tree structured directories grew out of this ability to create so-called subdirectories, which are just directory tables, where one of the entries is a file system object that is another directory. All right, that's the implementation. But logically, when you traverse it, you specify each directory separated by one of these so-called path separators, okay, forward slash or backslash, depending on the operating system that you're using. Any questions? Does that make sense? All right. And so this directory structure became very, very uh, useful. And so here's a tree-based directory structure. And it grew out of necessity, rather than having fixed directory structure, allow people to go to the file system and create their own directories. And so when you go on your operating system, whether it's through uh, the uh, user interface, the graphical user interface, you say create a folder or something like that, or you go on the command line and issue a command and make directory, what you're doing is instructing your operating system through one of your system tools to go ahead and create in whatever the current directory is, another entry and that other entry is gonna represent a file system object that contains a table of files and their addresses on disk. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? No questions? No? All right. And so this is a tree structure directory. And once you get your user directory, you're free to create whatever subdirectories you want adding to your directory tree. All right. No questions? No? All right. And so when you name a directory, each level of the directory is represented as a string that gets increasingly longer. You're adding suffixes to these strings where what's appended is the name of the subdirectory to change your context to that subdirectory. 
And when you list out your path, as I alluded to before, you need to separate each directory along the path, representing a particular level in the tree, which is your uh, directory tree on your file system. And so for Windows, that path separator, as I said before, is a backslash, which is this backwards line, if you will. And you start your path name with the drive letter followed by a colon. And then these backslashes separate the individual folders or directories and, and then ends in a file name with an optional extension. And so here we might say C colon backslash the dir1 directory. Inside of that table, there's a dir2 directory and a dir3 directory. And then within that dir3 directory is an entry called filename.ext. Now, of course, through the operating system and through things like the Python API for opening your file, you don't have access directly to the directory data structures. They're there and there are ways to access it, but the APIs in the generic Python APIs for opening and closing a file does not afford you the ability to access the table itself. Okay, any questions? No? And then in Unix, equivalently, we'd have forward slash directory one, directory two, directory three. And so these are tables within tables. And so directory one is a file system object, a table on disk. It has an entry called directory two, which is the address of another file system object on disk that is a table. And inside of that table is another entry called directory three, that name. And it is the name and address on disk of another table. And then within that, there's an entry called filename.ext, which is the file itself. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? And so in your project one, when you open the file, one of the things you have to open, what you have to specify is the path name where you store those CSV files uh, in the example code. That's really, really important, right? Now, if you're on Windows, of course, you can use backslash. But the problem is backslash is a reserved character in the language, right? Backslash is so-called an escape sequence. And I'll explain a little bit more about what that is in a slide or two. Okay. Any questions? Does that make sense? Yeah, all right. And so some of the pathologies. Now, when you specify a string, okay, you use either single quotes or double quotes, but the problem with backslash is that backslash is a trigger to uh, the runtime that the thing that follows is special. So if you want to represent the backslash character itself, when you have a string representing a path on your file system, you have to use backslash backslash. Because a single backslash won't work because your interpreter and your Python compiler is going to say, hey, single backslash means something special follows, right? And if you just use single backslash, it's going to get confused and you're going to get error messages. And so if you want to represent the actual backslash character, you need to specify backslash backslash. Okay. Any questions? Make sense? Yes. Not only the question, but you see that on mm -hmm. in Python, you can also do raw strings at the end of the final pass. Yes, you can. You can. Absolutely. Any other questions? No? All right. And so in Windows, it allows you to have directory names with spaces. And from the operating system perspective, there's really no such thing as directory with spaces. Windows is kind of doing something um, special with that. And so in Unix, the practice is typically you never have path names um, that have directories or with space characters. Now, if you did specify a directory with a space character, you're going to have to use backslash space that escape sequence to tell your system there's something special about this, right? And so there are two things you could do is either when you specify strings representing your path, you can use a backslash space to represent the space character, or you can just set up path names without spaces, okay? All right, any questions? That all make sense? Okay. And so, yeah, I think I said that. In Unix, we use forward slashes uh, to specify uh, path separators. 
And in this case, we start out with the home directory, uh, my account name, and some other directories underneath that, ending in the file name, file.txt. Now in Unix, and I think this is also the case in Windows, in each directory, when you create one of these tables in a new directory, it's pre-populated with two special directories. And their names are fixed. One is called dot, and the other is called dot dot. Now, dot refers to the current directory. I know it seems redundant, but you need a way to name the current directory. Dot dot refers to the parent directory. Going back to this tree uh, data structure, anytime you're in a particular folder or directory or table on the file system, when you say dot dot, you're referring to that directory one level above in the hierarchy. And so it's useful um, to be able to access the parent directory from the current directory for many applications. And these directory tables, when you create them, they're pre-populated with dot and dot dot. There's a tool on Windows called SIGWIN, which gives you a Unix-like environment on Windows. But if you go to the Windows command prompt icon, It'll pop up a window and we'll talk about the command line and the terminal interface in a few slides. And it allows you to specify these commands and interact with your file system um, from the command line. Any questions? No. Now, when you use your so-called WIMP interface, window icon menu pointer, when you create folders underneath the covers, that's the graphically in the depiction of your file system using sort of a digital analog of a, 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 an Atoms-based file system. You have like file cabinets and folders and things like that and subfolders. But underneath the covers on the Windows kernel and the Windows file system, it's really doing the same thing, creating these tables, pre-populating them with defaults, dot and dot, dot, and then um, composing entries whenever you create files, entries in the correct directory on disk data structure or file system object. Right, any questions? Does that make sense? All right, um, y'all are really quiet. So let's take a look at the command line. Now, the command line terminal is really important, especially for analytical types of applications, as well as server type applications. And so part of what we're gonna do in this class throughout, or at least at the right point in the semester, is we're gonna construct so-called pipelines or processing pipelines. And it's a lot more elegant uh, and useful to be able to do this from the command line versus from the debugger or from um, the graphical user interface. When you go on in the marketplace, server-based applications are typically done at the command line and you stitch together various programs that send output to one another, consume input from one another, that implement stages of processing. And this allows you to think at an experimental level because you can substitute and swap in and out different alternatives for various points of your processing for the data science um, process. Now, this command line here, I've given some examples and the one on the top left, your left, is the Windows command line. And the Windows command line takes inputs that are a little bit different from Unix and Linux and Mac OS but it does roughly the same thing, a few extra bells and whistles. On the right-hand side, that's the command line for Mac OS. And again, Mac OS is a version of BSD, Berkeley Systems Division Unix. And so it implements all of the standard Unix POSIX uh, commands. They've standardized across Unix platforms. Now down below, to give you a little bit of history and context about the command line, it all started in the early days of computing. Um, they had what was, what was called teletype. And teletype was an automated typewriter, a glorified typewriter was really what it was. And this was how you sent commands into your computer. And this is how it displayed back out the outputs from your program. Now, of course, there was no graphical user interface back then. Everything was based uh, in text. And so what you do is you sit at the teletype machine You'd be attached to the computer. You would type in a command, hit enter. It would get sent to the computer. It would compute something based on what you requested or run some program. It would send output back to you. 
and the typewriter, the teletype, would type out that output. And so there's a community out there um, in the Linux community that's trying to resurrect various teletypes and run Unix on it. I had the YouTube URL, but I thought I'd play a little bit for you and something just for some reason very soothing and satisfying about it. Um, and so let me just play that. And it was pretty loud. So someone has logged into a Linux system. Uname dash A is a command that says, tell me what version of Linux you're running or what version of the operating system you're running. And now it's asking for username. So someone's typing in and they'll hit enter and the system will respond. Uptime says, tell me how long you've been running since the last power cycle. Now you'll notice it prints from left to right. And when it gets to the end of a line, it returns the carriage back to the left-hand side, and then it advances the paper, uh, a so-called line feed. Now in modern terminals, it's literally a digital version of the teletype. And the reason why I bring this up is because what's really important when you're talking about lines and strings on your program, the DJ program, uh, to specify the end of the line. Now, carriage return refers to positioning the carriage or the cursor, if you will, back to the left-hand side of the line. And line feed refers to advancing the paper so that you have clean paper uh, to type on. And so this was preserved with the definition of strings, but Unix and Windows took different approaches. And so when you specify a string and you're gonna print something out to the command line, or the console in the debugger using PyCharm is to know when or how you specify the advancement of a line, i.e. what happens when you print out the string. In Windows, strings are terminated with carriage return line feed if you're going to print them. In Unix, it's just carriage return, right? But all of this lends its provenance uh, back to the teletypes uh, from the earliest days of shared user computing which is where it started. Okay, any questions about this? No questions? Does that make sense? All right. So it's also important to learn a little bit about the history to kind of know where some of this comes from. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna pop out uh, of the slides for a little bit and drive around the file system on Mac OS. And this is a uh, Unix variant. What I'll do is make uh, available post and course resources section on the Canvas site, a cheat sheet for what the equivalent commands are uh, in the Windows ecosystem. Okay, so let's come out here. Let's, uh, oh, let's see. I always, there we go. And I'm going to bring up my command line window. And this is a so-called terminal. Let me PD clear. Now, when I first log in, I'm given this command prompt. And first thing I do when I log in is it takes me to my so-called home directory, my user directory. And so in its implementation, most operating systems are implemented from the perspective of having multiple users that can log into the same machine. And so there are some commands. One's called PWD um, for present working directory. And you'll notice here, this cursor, it's blinking. Uh, there's something called a command line interpreter, whether Unix or Windows. And its job is to wait for user input. And when you type user input, it'll either try to find the program corresponding to what you type and run it. Or if it's your own program, it'll run it, provided it knows where to find it. Or it will give you an error message. So if I were to type do something, there's no command called do something. It says command not found. It doesn't know what I'm talking about. So if I type PWD, that is a command, stands for present working directory, shows me what directory I'm currently in. So you see here, I'm in slash users, which is the top of my file system, the so-called root of my file system. And within that, gwholeness, which is my user directory. Now, my particular machine, even though it's a laptop, it is managed by ITS. That was the choice I made uh, when I bought it. 
And so there are other accounts on here uh, for purposes they have uh, for scanning and other things. And so inside of this directory, of course, we want to be able to issue commands that says, show me the contents of this table. Show me all of the entries, the files that are in this table that implements our directory. And so in Windows, it's the command dir, but in Unix, it's ls that stands for listing. Now, when I say ls, you can see a bunch of different names. Some of them are files and some of them are directories. And so in a Unix environment, you might ask, well, how do I know? They're all strings. In this particular directory, slash user, slash the fullness, we have a bunch of entries, and each entry is showing the name. But you can also ask your file system, and I'll post this for Windows, ls-l says, show me the long version of the listing. Now, of course, if you take a look at this, you'll notice each one of these string entries that you saw before has a bunch of other pieces of information. And in the Unix environment, these pieces of information correspond to uh, the permissions and the ownership of these files. Because modern OS is written with multiple users in mind, associated with every file is someone who owns the file, as well as groups to which that person belongs, as well as anyone else who is not in that group and not that owner. If I direct your attention to that first column here, you'll see some of these entries begin with a D character and some have just a little dash mark. D stands for directory. And so everything here that has a D prefix is a directory. So you can actually pick out those parts or those entries in your uh, directory table uh, that correspond to other directories. Now, when I do this long listing, let me see if I can go back to it. Let me do this. Uh, let me go to Dropbox. And Dropbox um, is the Dropbox cloud storage system. And in a Unix environment, you can treat another file system, whether on your machine or on a server somewhere, as if it were another directory. And so while it looks like I'm navigating in the Dropbox directory, this is really stuff that has been cached or stored locally uh, that talks to a server in Dropbox's cloud, which is really Amazon AWS. So if I go to Dropbox, okay, CD stands for change directory, and I'll say Clark University, because that's the directory structure that I created. Um, by the way, when I say clear, I'm clearing the console to kind of wipe away all the text, um, if you're wondering what that means. And so Clark University classes, uh, what's in there? spring 2023 and you notice here it's my practice to use underscore and not use spaces right it makes your life a lot easier uh in a unix environment all right so now spring 2023 if i go in here i see python projects which is where i point my ide and the hello world is corresponding to uh the main.py uh, which I'll continue on with for drive through uh, for the balance of uh, today. Okay, so that is navigating your directory structure. Um, PWD, present working directory. And if I say CD space dot, remember that every directory is pre-populated with two things. There's the dot directory, uh, which refers to the current directory and dot dot is the parent. So if I change directory to dot, I'm still in the same directory. I can confirm that present working directory, PWD, and I'm still in the same location. So as you can see, this directory tree structure can get quite deep, I can have many levels, and you can branch out pretty widely. And it's really up to you how you organize it. You can make it as complex and specific as you want, or as general uh, and uh, coarse as you want. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? All right, so now, let me try change directory dot dot and also present working directory. And you notice here, I'm no longer in DSCI 125 hello world. I'm in Python projects, which is that parent directory one level up from where I was before. So C dot dot brings you up one level to the parent directory. And underneath the covers, that dot dot refers to another file table on your disk. 
that is the parent directory that contains the name of this directory. Any questions about this? And so I try to give you an illustration of what happens in the underlying machine, because when things go wrong, or if things go wrong, my belief is that empowers you the most, the strongest to be able to solve the problems that might occur. Okay. Any other questions? No questions? Make sense? No? All right. So now let's try um, creating a file. So let's go to spring 2023. And I'm going to run an editor um, called VI. Um, it's beyond the scope of this class. I personally like the command line tools because on a Unix environment, um, you can count on them to be there consistently. So if I say this is some um, text, so it's just a text file. I'm going to quit and save it. So now when I say ls, I see example.txt is that entry in that table for the directory. If I do a listing, ls-l, I see example.txt, it's a file, and I can type out uh, in Unix the contents, cat or concatenate example.txt, and I see the contents of that file. This is some text. Now, of course, one of the things I can do is create entries in my directory. If I have, I'm in spring 2023, on a Unix environment, I say mkdir, make directory, um, new directory name. So I do that. If I do a listing, ls, I see my new directory called new directory name. Okay. So you can create directories. You can also remove directories, rmdir, and then the name, new directory name. And if I do an ls again, you'll notice that directory is now gone. I've removed the file, um, the entry from the file table. And then underneath the covers, if that had locks associated with the file, um, the operating system is going to mark them as free, releasing them uh, for allocation for some other purpose. Okay. Any other questions? Any questions? No? All right. So let's go ahead, make directory, new directory name, and let's change directory to new directory name. And so now I notice there's nothing in there, right? It's a new table, directory, data structure um, on disk, and it doesn't have any contents. If I do an ls-l, the long listing, there's nothing in there. Now there's another version, ls-al, everything including uh, the hidden stuff. And you'll notice here in this new directory I created, I didn't put a file in there, but right away we have two default directories, the dot directory and the dot dot directory. And so those are pre-populated as a way to make it easier for you uh, to programmatically traverse up and down this tree, uh, namely your file system, your directory tree. Any questions? Does that make sense? Now, in a Unix system, there's something called the manual pages, and the manual pages are available on the command line. And it's just a little guide that tells you what different commands do. So if I say manual um, ls, it brings up the so-called manual pages, and it's just a textual description of what each command does. And there's a standard way you write these entries, and it'll associate it with each one of the requisite commands um, that you've associated it with. And so ls, it lists the directory contents. And when I say ls-a, it includes things that are hidden, things that have dots in them. Now, in a Unix environment, you can create a hidden file. A hidden file doesn't appear by default in the listing. And a hidden file is automatically hidden just by preceding its name with a dot character, period character. Any questions? Does that make sense? Yes. Um, manual, M-A-N, M-A-N space. And then the command name. So if I said mkdir, it gives me that manual page. They're available on the web, but I find it's easier. Maybe it's not, I don't know, um, to have it available at the command line. You could absolutely search for the manual pages um, with a browser and then just sort of have it by your side when you're looking at commands. Okay. Any other questions? No? All right. 
Um, and so there's also something called the directory stack. And a stack is a data structure uh, that acts like, you can think of it as a stack of plates. I don't know if you still have that in the dining hall. You have that stack of plates and it's kind of pressurized and you put the plates on and it kind of pushes down and spring loaded. You know that? No? Okay. Huh. All right. So, anyways, so a stack is a data structure. And imagine you have a set of plates and these plates uh, sit on a um, surface that has a piston and there's a spring, a spring load. And when you put another plate on, right, the weight of it compresses the spring. And the last thing, the last plate you put on is the first plate that you take off of it. And so in computer science, there's a useful data structure. Uh, among other data structures, you study when you take a data structures course um, called a stack. And a stack is useful uh, for temporary storage for certain types of operations. Moreover, underneath the covers uh, in the runtime uh, for languages like Python, when you call a function and you pass it parameters, in the runtime, a stack data structure is used uh, to pass those parameters from the block of behavior, which is your main program, to the block of behavior, which is your function. And so in Python, um, rather at the command line, there's a so-called directory stack. And this is useful for scenarios like the following. I'm in some directory and I wanna temporarily change where I am in the file system in order to examine something. And so here, if I say push D or push directory, let me type manual push D. And push D allows you to put another entry on your directory stack. And what it does is it changes directory to the new directory, but it preserves the old directories that you've already put on the stack. And so let me go ahead and demonstrate that to you. So here, PWD, I'm currently in new directory name. If I say push D, users, G wholeness, now all of a sudden, I'm taken to users, G wholeness, a whole other location in my file system. If I type DIRS, it shows me in reverse order from top of stack down to the bottom of the stack, all of the directories that are on my directory stack. So now I'm in my home directory, okay. And so let's say I wanted to temporarily go into documents, push the documents. Now I'm in users G wholeness documents. If I type there's, it shows me my stack from left to right. I'm currently in documents that's at the top of stack. And then the next one on the stack is that long path name, new directory name. So if I want to go back, pop D, I'm now back to my home directory and a, uh, a synonym for home directory is tilde or squiggle. And if I say pop D again, I'm back where I started, right? So it's just a useful thing because oftentimes when you're doing stuff, you might want to switch back and forth and oops, you don't want to have to type the whole path name again. So it's just a very useful tool uh, generally. Okay, and on SIGWIN on Windows, uh, the similar has been implemented. And so if you would like to get more conversant with the use of the command line on the Windows platform, I highly recommend you uh, install SIGWIN and I can make a uh, link to that available in the course resources section of the um, Canvas. I'm so trained to say Moodle of the Canvas site. Okay, any questions? No, makes sense? All right. Um, so let me see, make sure I... Uh, Push D, pop D, make directory, change directory, listing, PWD. Okay. Uh, so why don't we segue? I'll finish up the slide deck and we can segue into more PyCharm and we'll finish out the balance of today, which is 20 minutes um, with driving around PyCharm because I really wanted to take the opportunity uh, to show you some um, constructs in, in the debugger. Okay. Any questions about directories, command lines? No? All right, and so that's the end of the module. Again, uh, project is due tomorrow uh, at midnight. All right. So let me switch to um, PyCharm.
And I'm just gonna verify I'm still sharing for some reason in Zoom, when you exit PowerPoint, it stops the share. So let me just make sure it did. Uh, let me just share PyCharm. Oh, yes, yes, you know what? I forgot to say that. When you submit uh, the assignment, please make sure you follow the submission instructions. That helps me uh, to get everything graded much, much faster because your submissions will consist of a bunch of components. And please don't forget to include the Excel files and the CSV files, right? Uh, um, the Excel files allows me to validate that you're doing the replacement um, of missing entries with the average for the year. Um, but when you submit them, don't just upload them uh, to the Canvas site. Please make sure you put everything, including your reflection and your research notebook, uh, in a folder where that folder is your name, first name, last name, uh, and then compress it uh, using zip, right? Not RAR, not R, not Visa, uh, but just plain old zip. And so what you do is you put everything in a folder bearing your name, uh, and then you go ahead and compress it on Windows. If you right click, it'll bring up a menu. On Unix, uh, you run the zip program um, and then give it the name of the zip file, give it the name of the directory, making sure to say recursive. Okay. That is really, really important because as you can imagine, with 24 people in the class, if you hand something in, um, I don't want to have to assemble things for you. And please make sure that all the data files are there because um, I don't have the data files that you use. Okay. All right. Any questions? Yes. So the research notebook, is that like an ongoing file that we're going to submit each time, or is there a new one for each project that we do? Um, how you manage it is entirely up to you, but for each submission, only those entries for that particular project. Okay. So I don't need to see the whole stuff. Okay. And that's just to get you on the practice of uh, assembly material. Uh, for uh, yes, question. All of the above, any way that's useful for you. Your research notebook is for your benefit. Um, I will look at it, and because I'm curious to see also um, what you find useful. And so, if you find a source online, you would have a link. You could have bullet points, you could have number lists, you could have paragraphs. Um, maybe there's some thoughts you have about something. I tried this, it didn't work, and I found this other tool, and I found that when you use this tool, you have to give it these nuanced options in order to get to work in this book. Now, of course, when you're doing projects, some projects like the final project uh, will take you know, about two weeks or more. And as you find things that are useful, you wanna be able to pick back up where you left off or useful things you found because you're not gonna remember all of them. And that's the practice that I want you to get into writing things down uh, when you're doing any sort of inquiry or investigation is gonna be really important to know the out things that are useful where you left off and things like that. So that's the habit that I want everyone to um, build uh, from day one. Okay. So to answer your specific question, whatever you find useful, it could be links, it could be notes, it could be all sorts of things, but it's unique for each project because each project is going to be different. Any other questions? That makes sense? Yeah, all right. So let's go to PyCharm. And PyCharm is an IDE, like I said before, and it an IDE, treats your program as if it were a database. But I never really kind of was very specific about what I meant by that. And as a database, now you can go off and you can link to other things. Particularly useful are the libraries because it's a little bit cumbersome to switch back and forth between maybe something in a browser and something in your IDE as you're editing your program. And so here in a Python uh, IDE or in any IDE for any language, when you type, for example, sys, oops, let me stop the debugger, oh, sys dot, and you'll notice here, right, sys is a um, system variable and it allows you to access all sorts of constructs such as what's typed on the command line when you run this program. Now you notice here this tooltip brought up shows us all the different options that you can select these system variables within the sys reference. And so sysargv, right, that's the 
system variable that talks about command line parameters. And when you highlight things, it'll bring up help tips to show you what options you have. You can even ask the IDE to show you uh, the usage page for many of these APIs. And so that's really, really nice because it helps you to be productive so that you don't get into the, the unnecessary exercise of trying to memorize all the APIs, right? Our focus in this class is gonna be on the modeling constructs and building the pipelines and what certain choices uh, make possible with the resulting end-to-end -end process that you construct. And so I really recommend when you're crafting your program, you're laying out these blocks of behavior uh, for your algorithm, that you really make use of the IDE because it's a very nice productivity tool, especially if you're trying to refresh uh, memory about uh, various constructs in the language. And so the other thing that's really useful about the debugger is the runtime images. Now, of course, when you run a program in the debugger, there are two ways to run it. You can run it full speed, the regular run, which is this little triangle here up at the upper uh, right, your right of the screen. And you can also run it in debug mode, which is this, it's supposed to be a bug. I don't know if it's a beetle or what it is. But you'll notice here, when you debug it, it allows you to freeze your program in execution and step through these statements one at a time. Now, when you do the stepping, um, your entry point where it stops, of course, it'll start with the main entry point, which is what we specified down below, uh, which we talked about in our first uh, meeting. But inside of main, you notice here in the margin, I have this little red dot here, and that's a breakpoint. And any place you set a breakpoint, it's only on executable statements. So let me click here on line 37. You'll notice I set and I clear the breakpoint. When you debug it full speed uh, in the debugger, it'll stop at the first breakpoint. And anytime you continue running, it'll stop at the next breakpoint, the next breakpoint, and the next breakpoint. So usually, as a matter of practice, I'll set a breakpoint inside the main entry point. So let's go ahead and do that. And we'll use this as an opportunity to point out various um, aspects that are useful in the debugger. And so I hit um, the debug. And you notice here, now in the lower uh, left-hand side, um, let me try to blow that up, or at least make the real estate on the screen bigger. I have a bunch of controls that can do all sorts of interesting um, executions. Now, one of the key things you can do is this uh, icon here, and it stands for step over. When you step over or step through code in a debugger, to step through code means to execute one statement at a time right, at the language level. And so here, step over means go ahead and execute that next statement, making sure you return control to the next executable statement. And so here, if I say step over uh, for this assignment of the command line uh, string array to a variable args, the next executable statement is this if block, okay? Uh, now, another way of stepping is this one, that down arrow, that's called step into. And what step into means is if I have a function, which is the main uh, block of behavior, it's going to pass control to inside the first executable statement of that function. And so that's useful if you have a bunch of functions you've written, you're calling that function, and in the debugger, you can say, go ahead and pursue that function, go inside of it, and allow you to step through the statements for the function. Step over says, call the function. Don't go through the executable statements for that block of behavior, uh, namely the function. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? Yep, all right. So then the converse, there is step out. Step out says, if I'm in a block, namely a function, specifically a function, if I say step out, it'll execute to the return from that function and pass control to whatever uh, code called the function. And so let's say you're debugging, you wanna see what a function is doing, you step around a little bit, and you know, I'm done. I just want to see what happens after it returns. You run step out and it will run to the return back to the caller and the assignment of whatever that function returned to that variable assignment. Okay. Any questions? Does that make sense? And so if you subscribe to the developer network for various companies like Microsoft that makes Windows, Apple, with Mac OS, you can get access to the source code 
the so-called debuggable version of the operating system and even step into code for the debugger, right? It's quite an interesting exercise. Um, so if you're interested in system development and peeking underneath the covers of how these things work, I highly recommend you join that. Or if you're on the Unix side of things, that source code and those debuggable versions are available for free uh, since Linux is open source. Okay, any questions? No, all right. So now let's go ahead and we have sys argv and we're gonna single step or step over that command. And you notice here in the debugger window, I have the data structure representing what was read from the command line. If we go into the settings uh, for configuration for this particular project, you'll see here the script path is the location, that directory path of main.py, which is the routine or the Python function or Python program I'm debugging. But you also see this um, edit field with uh, parameters. And the parameters behave as in the debugger as if I ran it from the command line. Recall when I did a listing, I said ls, and I could say ls space dash l for the long listing. Every time you run a program on the command line, one of the things you can give it are what are called command line options. Now, how you do that in the debugger, in PyCharm specifically, is in the settings for that particular project, you input something on that parameter list. And that would be the same as if I went on the command line and I ran this Python program from the command line, and then after I said space dash name, and then Gary Holness in quotes. Okay. So how you get the programs, folks, any questions? No? All right. How you get programs um, to change their behavior from the command line, which will be useful when we start talking about processing pipelines, is you use these command line options. And so here, sysrv says, go ahead and get me a string of these command line options. Now, I'm not a fan of it, but PyCharm does it. You'll notice next to that statement, once I execute it, it gives me a rendering of what is in that data structure. I hate that, but you know, that's just one's opinion, um, not a fact. I'm honest enough to um, tell you the distinction. But nonetheless, in the debugger window, we can see that data structure, args, and it's an array. And you can actually go in and you can see the zeroth position, what's contained in that array, and in the oneth position, what's contained in that array. So it's an array of size two. And the beautiful part of a debugger is that you can examine the data structures and all the variable uh, assignments, but you can also go in and change them, right? If I wanted to, I could go in, Oop, double click, all right, control, uh, let's see, inspect, there we go. Uh, I'm thinking of um, NetBeans, um, question, yes. Question? Oh, I thought you, <laughs> all right. But in the debugger, I'm not gonna spend the time to figure it out now. And I'm so versed in NetBeans that I keep, um, uh, but anyways, in the debugger, you can also not only just examine the uh, values, you can also change the values. If I can get my edit for the assigned to work. So let's see. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. All right, I'll correct that in another meeting. But anyway, so you can change the values live in the debugger, you should be able to, um, in addition to examining their contents. And so here, uh, if I continue to step, I notice that my arg length is two. So I go ahead and print out uh, what I specified in that second position in args one. So I step over that. And if you I draw your attention here to the other tab in the lower left, uh, that represents the console. That's what you would see if you were running this from the command line. Um, it's showing you that that output is textually. If in your PyCharm program, if you, for example, drew a figure, it would pop up a window with the contents of whatever graphic or figure or visualization uh, that you specified. Uh, we will, for the visualization part and some of the analytics, uh, be using something called Jupyter Notebooks, uh, which is a nice interactive mechanism. But I stress that there's no substitute for the debugger because it Jupyter is a one-way thing. It allows you to see things, but you can't interact with your program in the way that you can in a full-blown uh, debugger. Okay. Any questions about this? That makes sense? Yeah, all right. 
So now what becomes particularly useful, I'm gonna step over in a bunch of places and I tend to be very profuse with my comments, but these comments tend to focus uh, more on the algorithmic steps, not on the individual programmatic constructs. And so we pre-populate a data structure uh, and NumPy array uh, to store all of the information read across the CSV files. And you can see here, if I go back to the debugger window, all data, you can see that depiction, it's a 2D array. It's an array of arrays where each entry in the outer uh, array um, is uh, an array. And so now let me continue to step here and I construct my file name. Now here, you'll notice here, I have two versions of my file path. I have a file path that goes through my directory structure and picks out uh, the directory for each one of the CSV files that I've exported from the original Excel files after doing that replacement. But here, when I run it, I change my file path to dot, right? Recall when we talked about the default entry in a directory, uh, we have the dot entry and we have the dot dot entry, which is the parent. And so here, the directory I call dot, uh, because when handing something in, you want to make sure that it's set up with a path um, that I can produce uh, from uh, your zip file. If you have it on users, Jane Smith, you know, classes, assignment one, for example, I don't have that path on my file system. So it's very, very useful after you're done and ready to hand it in that you arrange and organize your program so that you keep the data files that you're using in the same location as the Python file, uh, which is your program. Okay. All right. Any questions? So that way, yes. How do you feel in general about asking users to specify file paths in these sort of projects? Um, I would rather just run uh, without having any input um, because you know we have 24 of you and then uh, yeah. 24 times and looked at it. So it makes it a lot easier for me to 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 go to I do look at all of the code. Um, please make sure it runs and it is error free. And that means a good way to do it is when you create your zip file uh, to unzip it in another location on your file system and then try running it um, from the zip because that's what my experience will be. I'll download it, the zip file, unzip it, and then run it. Right? It really increases the time for grading um, 2x and 3x if I have to go and chase things down. Right. Any questions? Yes. Where are you? Oh, I didn't specify that. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm in uh, biophysics uh, BP 3.2. Any other questions? Please come by office hours. Office hours are some of the loneliest times at the university. Hardly anyone ever comes to office hours. More than happy uh, to help you uh, succeed. And we have one minute left. Okay. So, um, Let's see, what else did I wanna say? Make sure you close your um, files. And then another important part as far as a PyCharmism goes, is that when you go into the configuration for your project, that's specific to the project itself. But when you set up the um, Python version, you go into PyCharm menu, there's a preferences choice, and you can actually select uh, the version of the Python interpreter. Now, with that selection, you can install different packages. And so, for example, matplotlib or other um, API libraries, you're going to have to add those, and it'll be associated with that particular named uh, version of the Python interpreter. Because one of the things you can do is in PyCharm, not only can you select different Python interpreter versions, you might want 2.x or 3.10 or 3.9, you can also select virtual environments uh, through Anaconda directly from PyCharm. And so with that selection of interpreter comes uh, the libraries associated with it. So if you find you're trying to run something like CSV read, uh, you say create a CSV reader and it's a, eh, you know, I don't understand what CSV.reader is. Um, it means that you don't have that library, the CSV installed, okay? All right, uh, so with that, I'll end there. We're 30 seconds over. Um, and I'll stop the video. Um, hope to see you in office hours. If it doesn't work for you, please reach out. I can do Zoom office hours. I can, you know, answer all sorts of questions for you. Right. Sure. Sure. Let me um, let me stop Zoom. And.
Where is my Zoom control? Uh oh. All right. So cancel. Where's my? Ah, there we are. Ah, there it is. Stop recording.